CEO of Mile. Mile is Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship. Thank you very much, Dr. Saab, for uh, joining us and taking your time out. Uh, Dr. Saab, first of all, do tell us about uh, the organization which is Mile. Plus, normally, whenever we think of Saudi Arabia, we do not come up with the impression that Saudi Arabia will have universities of this level, sir. Okay. So do educate us about that, please. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to thank you very much for inviting me for this program. Uh, this is, by the way, my first uh, visit uh, ever to Pakistan, and uh, I'm very happy and impressed with what I have seen so far. Uh, the institute, which I am the CEO of, is uh, called the Medina Institute mm -hmm. for Leadership and Entrepreneurship. It is uh, one of the first initiative of Medina Knowledge Economic City. Okay. Uh, as you might know, my Saudi Arabia have uh, five, uh, have two main economic cities, which is Jubail and Yamba, in the east coast and the west coast of Saudi Arabia. And uh, these two economic cities has proven to be very successful model and uh, played a, a great role in the development and job creation in Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia decided to establish another five new economic cities in different places and locations of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And all of them operate under the uh, patronage of the uh, SAGIA, which is the Saudi Arabian General Investment Authority. Okay. Is that a consortium of banks or what, sir? Yeah, no, it, it, is, it is the authority in Saudi Arabia responsible for the raising the competitiveness of Saudi Arabia and the attracting okay. foreign investment into okay. Saudi Arabia. That's like a board of investment or something of that sort. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And they look after the new economic cities. Mm -hmm. So one of these economic cities is in Medina. And it's called Medina Knowledge Economic City. Okay. And King Abdullah laid the foundation of uh, this city a few years ago. And this city differs from the other cities because it focuses on knowledge industries, while the other cities focus on other aspects of economy, like petrochemical industries or agriculture. The Medina Knowledge Economic City, being in Medina, which is a very unique place, and the, you know, the, the, the first capital of Islam, and the place from which knowledge has spread to all over the world. So, we so is that the reason why it was based in Medina? Sir? Based in Medina. And okay. it's not very far from the Masjid in Nabu Sharif. Okay. It's about 3.5 kilometers. Oh, it's very close. Very close okay. to the Masjid. In fact, from our offices, we can see the minarets of the uh, Masjid in Nabu Sharif. MashaAllah. So, the Medina Knowledge Economic City was uh, searching for an opportunity to contribute to social and economical development mm -hmm. in the Muslim countries. And uh, as you know, every year the reports by United Nations and World Bank rank, you know, the, wo the countries in the world. And uh, unfortunately, Muslim countries usually they come in the bottom of the list. That's correct, sir. And uh, we look at this with big grief and sorrow, and we don't know what to do about that. And uh, uh, in fact, when you read behind the uh, statistics, you will find that the key reason behind the low position that our Muslim countries are located at is the lack of uh, ethic, uh, ethical, committed, competent leaders. Okay. What they call com uh, leadership deficit. Okay. So the Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship was established as the first initiative of the Knowledge Economic City to contribute to bridging this leadership deficit gap and uh, we thought that by contributing to human capital development at the level of leadership, this is the best contribution that we can offer the whole Muslims and the underdeveloped countries. Uh, the point is that it is all about knowledge-based economy now. That is the new concept. Look at what the Americans have done in Silicon Valley. Yes. It's about the human capital. I mean, the ability of a man to perform at the optimum level is what is required at the moment. Exactly. Now, sir, so looking at the, uh, the Saudi model of, of economic growth, Primarily, we have never seen anything made in Saudi Arabia. I mean, even you go uh, for Umrah, you end up buying a, a Janamas or a praying mat, basically, that's what it is called, or, or maybe uh, a cap to offer praise. I mean, they're all made in China, primarily. Uh, now, what we've recently witnessed is that uh, made in Jeddah or made in uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, canned food, juice, value-added products. Yes. So, so, this means that primarily, since the Saudi economy was based on oil. You're also shifting towards knowledge-based economy as well as manufacturing. Is that correct, sir? This, uh, this is exactly right. 
in fact uh, prior to my position in uh, in uh, knowledge economic city i used to be the vice president of savola group and savola is the largest producer in the world of branded edible oil okay and we have manufacturing facilities in 17 muslim countries from kazakhstan to casablanca mm -hmm. so this is a saudi based manufacturing uh, industry which uh, have uh, built competence in the area of edible oil and had it spread all over the world now and have one of the largest imports of pakistan is also about the edible oil but we get it from uh, in malaysia and indonesia right. primarily exactly right. so the the saudi economy started to diversify uh, and stay just out. like uae for instance yeah. i mean look at the tourism in uae yes and for instance like people go and for, for shopping and right. and they're just glowing and growing though it's a small country but yes. yet see and i'm sure that next time you come and visit medina you will find lots of products which is titled you're labeled made in medina there is a big initiative now in saudi arabia led by prince faisal bin salman bin abdul aziz mm -hmm. the prince of the medina region which is called made in medina and it focus on the local industries which is uh, be of, uh, to produce products that the to, uh, the visitors of the holy masjid can take back home and it's labeled in medina and they are supporting all home-based manufacturers and the medium are like the cottage industries small industries the small industries exactly okay so the made in in, in medina they will be labeled made in medina and inshallah very soon that this made in china products you will not find many of them and there is lots of funding and encouragement mm -hmm. and subsidy provided to products produced in, in medina and uh, education for example i was talking now about the medina institute you know people used to come to saudi arabia mainly to perform Hajj and Umrah and uh, you or know to seek for a job or seek Family. for a job exactly yes. but uh, for the first time executives are coming all the way from Brunei from Holland from China from Pakistan from America mm -hmm. and they come to Medina to attend executive education training program which is now competing with the top brands of the business schools like you see in INSEAD or Harvard or Wharton so Alhamdulillah we managed gradually to establish the uh, position of Saudi Arabia and Medina in specific the sea, holy city of Medina as a hub of executive education and leadership development exchange and uh, let me also mention something which is related to my visit to Pakistan mm -hmm. you know traditionally uh, training and education used to take place in uh, bricks and mortar setting you know you have to have a classroom and the teacher has to be there and the students has to be there and there is lots of accessibility constraints correct you have to have visa you mm -hmm. have to have money and the travel and so on now with the uh, with the technology you can have you can uh, sit in another country and you can work for them exactly you can deploy resources from many subject matter experts especially muslim professors mm -hmm. and the scholars who has migrated to north america and canada and australia and they wish to serve their home countries yes but correct. they cannot find the right opportunity to come back home so you're providing that too exactly this is exactly what we do we use information and communication technology through our online platform we invite those professors muslim professors and even non-muslims everybody is welcome to contribute through the online platform in fact our online platform is operated by a pakistani company okay good. and i am here to visit this pakistani company great so it's a company here in islamabad back cyber the they maintain our website people think that we have an army of developers and programmers it's not, sitting it's in no more like that you know yes. you might have a an army of five people five, yes. working for the entire yes, exactly. IT setup. Right. Now, Professor, another one important factor is that the moment we think of Saudi Arabia, the first thing which comes into our mind, a holy, uh, you know, so a holy city, um, Mecca, Medina al Manavra, uh, and primarily it's more about, you know, going there, performing Umrah, performing Hajj. And later on, uh, the moment we think other than anything else, uh, maybe as I earlier mentioned it's about a job if you're a doctor or if you're a labor you have places because the most remittances which we get are from Saudi Arabia and obviously it's a brotherly country now the point is that uh, Saudi Arabia has got universities I'm sure they are uh, you know they have so many other ventures uh, in many other areas they're getting into manufacturing they are also getting into services they are also uh, coming up as a country which has the potential to do so much. Another important fact 
that most of us think that Saudi Arabia, everybody is a sheikh there, everybody is very rich, they don't work at all, all they need is foreign people to come in and work for them. Is that the right perception yes. or, or is it changing over time? You know, I think if to a great extent uh, this was uh, somewhat uh, right some time ago, but now uh, the Saudi Arabia has invested a lot into its human capital development. Okay. Education budget in Saudi Arabia represents one third of the Saudi budget. Astronomical figures has been assigned this year and the last year by King Abdullah government in order to promote higher education and basic education. In fact, the scholarship program of King Abdullah mm -hmm. to send young Saudi overseas and obtain their undergraduate and uh, uh, master program PhD, huge number of Saudis, thousands of them, literally thousands. They go now for the last few years and they are coming back and they are assuming very senior positions. So the trend is changing now. It's Normally uh, the, you know, uh, the kafil would be a Saudi yes. and number two who will be the main person doing everything yes. would be a foreigner normally. Yes. But in this case the next generation has shown a different trend altogether. Yes, and the, the new laws mm -hmm. also in Saudi Arabia, there is a, the Minister of Labor in Saudi Arabia came up with so many initiatives okay. that ensure that each business has to be owned by Saudis, registered by Saudis, operated okay. you know, by Saudis, and it control all of this. You know, th during the past years, people who used to come to Umrah, some of them stay behind. and uh, So all of those illegal residents of Saudi Arabia, they have been dealt with in a, in a very s strict way. They have been given enough notice to either to have a, a formal, uh, legitimate uh, residence in Saudi Arabia or they depart the country. So the labor market in Saudi Arabia have been restructured to a great extent. In fact, let me share with you something is that just we just finished two weeks ago in the Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship. The Human Resources Development Fund of Saudi Arabia have announced for a leadership development program for the potential young leaders of Saudi Lovely. Arabia. That's and good. Uh, 50 of those young leaders, when, when they announced for the scholarship, 1,000 plus applications were received in the first three days. Okay. And the application only for people who has a master degree, prefer to have a master degree, fluent in English, has at least five years experience in business sector, so we got above 1,000 applications, hand-picked the top 50 of them. They went through a very advanced program for the past two weeks, and it was an overwhelming experience. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the Saudi young potential leader, they really showed that they are very competent and in bar with the international. Uh, in fact, the professor who came to teach from Harvard, they told us, that the quality of discussion that we have in the classroom is very much comparable to the quality of discussion that they see in the top uh, business school in the world. That's really, really interesting. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Saab, uh, another very important point is about the overall education system in the Muslim Umma. Uh, whenever we think of education primarily, it's, it's USA, it's UK, it's Canada or it's Australia, or any English-speaking country, a lot of people do go to Europe now. But nobody goes, I still remember a lot of people from Africa and Middle East used to come to Pakistan and study here. Over, a, over the last, let's say, three decades or so, the educational level in the Muslim countries have gone down. And whenever we think of the top 500 uh, universities, not even one university is in the Muslim countries, despite having that kind of resources. Do you think, sir, Saudi Arabia being the leader in so many aspects, has taken the initiative to come up with such innovative ideas to have the top 10 universities because I remember I was reading an article about the women university in Saudi Arabia. Exactly. That is one class and a half in Saudi yes. Arabia. Tell us about that, sir. Yes, sir. in fact, uh, if you, you know, you are, we invite you to come and visit Saudi Arabia, the, uh, the King Abdullah University for Science and Technology is a state-of-the-art university now, operating only 70 kilometers north of Jeddah. And it's, it attracted the top professors in the world. Ifat College and uh, no, uh, Br 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 Prince, uh, Prince Noura College uh, and the King, Ab King Fahd University for Petroleum and Mineral, King Saud University. Many of those universities have started to achieve international ranking. In, 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 but my institute, which I am the CEO of, 
focus on a different type of education, okay. which is called executive education. Okay. Executive education is not for a student. It's not a, it's not a postgraduate program. It is an, for the for, entrepreneurship. For, and it is for the practicing executives, people who are already working in the private or government organization and have many years of experience. Financial Times every year produce a report of the top 100 MBA program in the world and the top 65 executive education providers in the world. Unfortunately, none of them in a Muslim or an Arab country. They are not, none of them in Turkey or in Egypt or in United Arab Emirates or in Malaysia. Why is that so? Education is not the priority for most of yeah. these countries? You see, we... Or normally we tend to, because since these are rich countries, people are rich, so they go abroad. Yes. Most probably that is the yes. reason. So, Harvard so or Stanford or Oxford, these are the benchmarks at Cambridge University. Yeah. Uh, I think this is, uh, this is one reason. But, you know, but we started, instead of looking at those statistics every year with a grief and sorrow and say, you know, what a bad position we are in, we stopped and we said we have to make a decision. Dr. Hassan, uh, Professor Hassan Iqbal, the, His Excellency, yeah. the Minister of Planning and Development and Reform, he was my colleague. We used to study together at University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And another colleague of ours, Saudi, Dr. Sami Baroum, we used to meet every year and talk about how sorry we are for not having in any Muslim country an executive education and leadership development you know, institute of a reputable status. And we made the decision and we said, if it's not now, then when? And if it's not by us, then by who? And if it's not in Medina, then where? And the idea of mine came from this. So Alhamdulillah, having this uh, executive education program and leadership development program in Medina, I think is the first step that you will see transforming the landscape of leadership development. We, every year we have almost one 10 million visitors coming to Medina with the new international airport and the new fast train coming from Mecca. The number of visitors to, to Medina and the expansion of the Masjid Nabawi now, if you go to the Masjid Nabawi, the whole area next to Al Baqia has been demolished and there is a big expansion approved by King Abdullah. All of this increases the capacity of Medina to receive visitors. Yes. And we don't want visitors, as you highlighted earlier, just to come to perform the prayer and perform the Umrah and go. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Holy Quran, وَلْيَشْهَدُوا مَنَافِعَ لَهُمْ Muslims in the early times of Prophet Muhammad used to be shy to go to perform their Umrah and the Hajj and in the same time do any commercial transaction. They thought that the commercial transaction during Hajj is spoil their niyyat and the intention and their you know, ibadat will not be purely accepted. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Holy Quran, it is okay for you to take some worldly benefits during your visit to Hajj and Umrah. Yes. So what we are trying to do that people when they come to Medina, many of them spend like eight days because some have believed that you should pray at least 40 prayers. And 40 prayers is eight days, so because five times eight is equal to 40. But in the eight, eight, for eight days, performing namaz in the masjid will only consume, let us say, one hour per each namaz. All this the five, is five days hours. together, yes. Yeah, five hours. So what you do the remaining of the day? So we are organizing now lots of educational and the cultural events. Even the tourism is, is, is of great idea because I remember yeah. I have seen the uh, place where this uh, Ghazwai Ohud took place. Exactly. So I have been there, you know. And uh, But Professor, last quick comment. Okay. Something which really bothers me. I know there are 57 Islamic countries. Almost there are more than 1.6 billion Muslims in the world, alhamdulillah. The population is increasing. But when I look at the figures, I mean, look at the resources which the Islamic countries, they have. But their GDP put together is one-third of Germany and one-fourth of Japan. Why not towards value addition and moving in the right direction? What needs to be done, sir? I think the critical thing is the human capital development. The, uh, the, the lack of a committed, ethical, trustworthy, competent leadership is behind this. And the, there are lots of funds that has been uh, channeled and funded to underdeveloped Muslim countries, but it gets sucked and it disappears and it does not have the sustainability. So, uh, and that's why the, we should focus in human capital development and make sure that we have new generation of committed, competent leaders who can, uh, you the know. The good decision makers. Yes, and they can lead the social and economical development in our countries. So I think this is where we need to start. All right. Thank you very much, Professor. Very it was welcome. a pleasure talking to you, it's sir, to and good luck in your future endeavors, sir. Thank you.
With this, we come to the end of our first segment, and in the next segment, we'll be talking to Professor Ibrahim, the member of the committee who's negotiating uh, with the Taliban, and we'll talk to him about the updates and the details. Just stay with us. We'll just take a short break here.